So first, I just want to start with a, an outline uh, and uh, teaching objectives for this lecture. Um, first thing we'll discuss is, is light propagation across spatial scales. So biophotonic methods are used to uh, gain some insight into biological structures from the submicron scale all the way to the organ scale. And so you have several orders of magnitude range of, of spatial scales. And depending on the technology that you use, the, the information that you're interested in, um, the types of light propagation models that you would be interested in using will differ. And so uh, we'll talk about kind of the, the, the major light propagation models that are in use in our field, uh, get an understanding about their applicability and limitations uh, across spatial scales. Um, another aspect of biophotonics is that there are many people that are working on a therapy, um, trying to make a change or, or modify the tissue in some way. And then there are others that are focused more on imaging and diagnostics. And it turns out that those two different applications, you have very different interests with respect to uh, uh, the consideration of the light propagation. In one case, you're very interested in the three-dimensional light field within the tissue, whereas in diagnostics, you're typically focused more on what you can measure at the boundaries of tissue. We're going to talk about those different considerations, how they're linked, and, and how that may impact uh, what you're interested in modeling and how you go about that. Now, within a radiative transport context, we'll learn something uh, called uh, the radiance. And this is something that many people may not be familiar with, it's uh, kind of the primitive descriptor for light transport um, in the radiative transport context. It's a six-dimensional object. We'll talk about the six dimensions in a bit. And uh, once you know the, the radiance for a given problem, you have a complete description of the temporal, the spatial, and the directional characteristics of light transport within that system. And all measurements that you make are, can be derived from from, from the radiance if you have a solution for it. Now what gives rise to the six dimensional object is the interaction of the light with the tissue. And fundamentally the interactions that the light has with the tissue are governed by absorption and scattering events. And again in a radio transport context we'll learn how light propagation is modified separately by absorption and scattering and how by tracking and, and accurately modeling absorption and scattering in a three dimensional context you can model this mathematically using something called the radiative transport equation, uh, which we abbreviate using RTE. And so we'll um, have an informal derivation of the radiative transport equation. And this kind of first four topics will be kind of the first half of this course. It's all focused on kind of modeling and computation. Now, once you have kind of a, a governing model for light transport, um, that's not enough to define your problem. The other thing that's very important is how you represent the tissue optically. And so we need to learn something about the optical properties of tissue. And so we'll talk about the origins and the characteristics and spectral dependence, the wavelength dependence of uh, optical scattering and absorption in tissue. It's very important to know where these come from and how they relate to tissue structure and physiology. And when you put together the underlying physics of light transport within tissues, with their optical properties, what naturally arises are characteristic spatial scales and temporal scales that govern uh, light transport in tissue. And these spatial and temporal scales are very important because they have direct bearing on the spatial and temporal characteristics of the technologies that you're building and how you might shape the light uh, in illumination as well as in detection to gain the information that you want, okay? So we're gonna hit on each of these topics uh, very superficially in some way, but these themes will be recurring throughout the entire week. And so it's a good place to introduce them now. So um, just remind everyone, you know, the classical description of light is as an electromagnetic wave, where, um, which is a transverse wave in that the direction of propagation is mutually orthogonal to oscillations in the electric field and magnetic field. Um, when we think about light, we typically think about wavelengths on the order of a few hundred nanometers out to about 10 microns. Below 100 nanometers, you're thinking more like soft x-rays. Above 10 microns, you're thinking more in the radio wave regime. So kind of light is crudely 
um, considered in this, this narrow bound of wavelengths. Um, and this is kind of the rigorous, you know, thinking about light in terms of electromagnetic waves, um, apart from quantum phenomenon, is kind of the classical rigorous wave-like description of, of light. Um, it turns out that in the context of radio transport in, in computational biophotonics, that sometimes it's, it's very convenient to think about light as the propagation of neutral particles, which we call photons. And um, these are localized, massless quantum of energy. There's a relationship between the energy of a single photon and its wavelength. It's inversely proportional to wavelength. So obviously, as you go longer in wavelength, the each quanta of energy has, has lower energetics, and it's parameterized by Planck's constant. Now, what's very important to recognize is that when you're in the visible to near infrared, the energy, the characteristic energy of a photon of light uh, tends to be matched with um, the promotion of electronic states within molecules. So you're actually probing uh, the electronic uh, properties of biomolecules. And then when you get into the infrared, you start to, to probe or excite vibrational characteristics of molecules. So fundamentally, what, gives, what the power of biophotonics lies in spectral measurements and by looking at how things change with wavelength, you're actually probing uh, the electronic and vibrational structure of that tissue. Okay, and so that essentially gives rise in the motivation for the whole area of spectroscopy. Now, again, in the context um, of all other electromagnetic waves, you know, light occupies this very narrow band. And what's interesting just to think about is the spatial scale. So the spatial scales that we'll be focusing on mostly are in the order of hundreds of nanometers to microns. And that's, that spatial scale is actually very relevant to biology, as we'll learn, uh, as we'll learn throughout the course. That the ranges of biological structures that we're typically interested in you know, are down to, say, smallest units are on the order of lipid bilayers, um, small lysosomes, and organelles within cells, which are on the order of tens to hundreds of nanometers, all the way up to organs, which, of course, are on the centimeter scale. But um, there's kind of a matching, or there's uh, the, the ability to probe biological tissues using oscillations on the hundreds of nanometers to micron scale gives you great insight as to the, the characteristics and organization of these structures. So it's not just the characteristic spatial scale of the electromagnetic oscillation that matters. It's also how long we allow the propagation of the light to occur within the tissue before we detect it or are interested in, in its modification. So it's very interesting to think about the spatial scales in, in biomedical photonics. And so, you know, there a vast array of technologies, all the way going from various um, microscopy techniques, as simple as you know, bright field or phase contrast microscopy, more sophisticated microscopy techniques, such as multiphoton or second harmonic, harmonic generation microscopy. These methods tend to probe tissues on the submicron scale. Okay? And the, um, the utility of these techniques actually is linked directly uh, to the coherence and wave propagation character of light. Okay, and so just intrinsically, if you want to actually model and understand processes that uh, give rise to microscopy, we'll hear about optical coherence tomography in a bit, uh, and speckle imaging, which um, gives you flow information. All of these rely on properties such as interference, coherence, diffraction, things like that. And that has direct bearing on the types of models one will use. Now, as you let light propagate further, what happens is that the optical phase relationships between the light waves get scrambled, and you lose coherence. And once you lose coherence, you kind of lose the ability to, 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 to actually um, drive resonance, drive interference. And it allows you to simplify your consideration of light propagation to kind of from the wave description to kind of the neutral uh, particle description. And that's when we start to kind of propagate light on the order of hundreds of microns to millimeters. And so techniques such as spatial frequency domain imaging, which is able to probe uh, tissues on the spatial scales of a few hundred microns to millimeters, and diffuse optical spectroscopy and imaging techniques that really probe tissues on the millimeter regime, um, 
um, or techniques and, and utilize properties of light propagation on, uh, in this kind of diffuse, diffusive scale. So the, the typical models that we use you know, reflect that. Um, so given that on the micro scale, you're on spatial scales comparable to the wavelength of light, these techniques typically have uh, resolutions on the order of a submicron to tens of microns. They rely on coherence effects, interference effects. So really, if you want to model these phenomenon, you're really going to have to rely on a rigorous Maxwell's equations uh, sort of uh, description. As these optical phase relationships get scrambled and, and, and get decay, you, know, you, you have a randomization of these. You can start to take on what's, what's called a, a radiative transport context. And the characteristic spatial scale where you kind of transition from a wave-like description of light to where you can get away with a particle description of light is parameterized by the spatial scale that we refer to as L sub s. L sub s is uh, called the single scattering length. And it's, on average, the distance a photon travels before it encounters scattering within tissue. Now, in most tissues, this is on a spatial scale between, say, 5 and 50 microns. Okay, So once um, light propagates on the order of 5 to 50 microns, probably closer to 50 microns, if you undergo multiple scattering events, you're going to start to lose the ability to maintain coherence in your light field. And you can adopt this more practical, this more simplistic notion of, of treating light as propagation of neutral <coughs> particles. Now, if you let light propagate further within tissue, not only have you lost coherence, but the photons have lost memory of their initial direction. Okay, so it's kind of like a persistence length. So once the photon undergoes several scattering events, tens to hundreds of scattering events, the light has no memory with respect to its initial direction. And you can think about light propagation as a diffusion, a modified diffusion process. Um, it's not exactly a diffusion process because you can still have absorption. So you can have extinction or disappearance of light. So it's not exactly like a heat diffusion equation, but it's a, it's a diffusion equation with loss. And this gives rise to simplifications of the radiator transport equation, which you'll find is not an easy equation to solve, uh, into something called the diffusion approximation. So I just want to... Um, you know, dig slightly deeper just to think about the the range of applicability, the strengths, and the challenges with using any of these descriptions. So as I alluded to, the Maxwell's equations provide a rigorous model for electromagnetic wave propagation in, in turbid media, media that both absorbs and scatters light. It models all wave phenomenon, interference, diffraction, uh, polarization. And it's accurate pretty much on all spatial scales that we're interested in uh, in the context of biomedical optics. Now. In order to solve Maxwell's equations, you need to know something about uh, how the material can support the propagation of both electric fields and magnetic fields. And those are parameterized using these two uh, properties called the dielectric permeability and permittivity. And the challenge one has when trying to apply Maxwell's equations to a tissue con context is that we really don't have a good handle on what values uh, to use. So they're often unknown. Um, there are ways you can get at them, uh, but it's, it's a far from a, um, a, a settled matter, and it's, it's hard to measure directly. The other challenge is that solving Maxwell's equations in a three-dimensional heterogeneous system on spatial scales relevant to biomedical optics is incredibly computationally expensive. So um, there's been... Uh, significant advances in the last decade or so. The kind of the two primary groups are Vadim Bachman's group at Northwestern University and uh, Andrew Dunn's group at UT Austin. If you look at their papers, they tend to uh, model, say, focus beam propagation in vo tissue volume, say, 100 microns by 100 microns by 100 microns. And it takes probably, uh, not kidding, about 1,000 hours of computational time on massively uh, parallel system. So um, advances will continue to be made. And a lot of insight does come from running these simulations, especially with respect to microscopy. But um, 
but uh, its usage, its routine use for, um, for doing, say, imaging uh, computationally is quite limited. Okay? So, as I said, if you let light propagate sufficient distances in tissue, the optical phase relationships of, of the light get scrambled, and you no longer have coherent wave propagation. And you can treat uh, the light propagation as the transport of photons. Interestingly, the radiative transport equation, which we'll see in a few moments, can be derived by, from Maxwell's equations with two uh, very important considerations. One is that we assume that light scattering happens due to interaction of the electromagnetic wave with discrete particles. And you assume that the particles in the tissue have a spatial configuration such that each particle lies in the electromagnetic far field of the other particles. Okay, so you have a, when you have an interaction between an electromagnetic wave and a particle, you have a near field uh, regime, and then you have a far field. And you assume that there are no particles in the near field of any other particle, okay? The second thing that you have to assume is that the actual particle positions within the tissue are random. And the reason why they need to be random is that if you have an ordered configuration of particles, then what can happen is that you actually have discrete, you have actually a deterministic optical phase relationship between the interaction of the wave with one particle and then the next particle and the next particle, and you can actually drive interference through that system. And so, and that can't be really handled properly in radiative transport. So it's very important that you have a random medium. And um, so this again is not uh, a wave model, it's a scalar model, so you don't have a phase, you just have an intensity, a scalar model. And it cannot predict interference or diffraction effects, but you can handle polarization. And you can handle polarization using a transport equation for each Stokes vector components. And Stokes vector is a way of modeling or characterizing the polarization state of light within a radiative transport context. OK, and again, so radiative transport, you can start to use it when you're on spatial scales of tens to hundreds of, of microns in the tissue. OK? Now, as you'll see, radio transport equation is not easy to solve, so people still have focused on how can we simplify this further. And this gave rise to what's known as the standard diffusion and PN approximations. It's an approximate solution to the radio transport equation, and we'll find out that the way that you describe light in the tissues by thinking about at any location, what is the direction of light emanating from, uh, from a given location? So you actually have a function that lies on the surface of a unit sphere, okay? And so what we do in the radiative transport, going from the radiative transport equation to the diffusion approximation is that we represent the solution of this function that lies on the unit sphere uh, uh, using Legendre polynomials, which is a, gives you an orthogonal basis set for, for describing functions on a unit sphere. And this is an infinite series of polynomials and the higher you go up in order, the more accurate it becomes. And the PN approximation just says, okay, we're going to truncate that Legendre polynomial expansion at order n. And if you do that, you'll end up getting uh, n plus 1 coupled partial differential equations. Okay? The radiative transport equation itself is, a, is an integral differential equation. And this reduces that to a system of partial differential equations. In our our field, you often see that they truncate this expansion at the first term. So you, you uh, actually just take uh, the first two Legendre polynomials, and this gives rise to the standard diffusion, or P1 approximation. Uh, and so that gives you two coupled partial differential equations. You can solve it fairly easily. These have a long history in the development uh, uh, and usage in, in biophotonics. It's very simplistic, but yet is actually quite accurate in certain cases. And those cases are when the medium is highly scattering. And we'll talk about what we mean by highly scattering um, in a few moments. And, at, and when you're considering the light field at locations that are far away from optical sources and from boundaries. Because uh, sources tend to be collimated sources, so they're highly directional. And 
uh, the diffusion approximation and PN approximations do not do well with highly directional light sources. And boundaries, especially where you have refractive index mismatches, you also have a very directional light field in those locations. And so this is when these equations tend to fail. Still, it's provided a very useful and important um, framework um, throughout the field of diffuse optics. So um, one thing to think about uh, this is kind of an overwhelming slide, but just it's a useful slide, is that the biophotonics technologies, you can think about their characteristics kind of on this plot of, of what is the intrinsic resolution, spatial resolution that that technique provides, and how far, how deeply in tissue can it penetrate. And it's very interesting that the technologies kind of fall on, you know, kind of a line that, you know, as you want to penetrate deeper, you have to sacrifice resolution, okay? But yet, these spatial scales all have unique importance, right? If you're interested in cells, their structure and their metabolism, you need to, um, to probe on the micron scale. But cell function by themselves may not be relevant. You may be interested in how do the cells interact with its extracellular environment, the matrix proteins, with the vasculature. In those cases, you're really looking at a physiological unit of tissue, and there you want to probe the tissue on the orders of hundreds of microns to millimeters. And larger still, if you want to look at the function of an organ, such as a brain or a breast, you're really interested in the millimeter to centimeter uh, spatial scale. And so there are technologies that lie on this direction. And just um, is important to kind of bear in mind, these spatial scales relevant uh, related to the spatial scales of the modeling uh, techniques that we just described, okay? Okay, and you'll have copy of all these slides, so you'll, have, uh, you'll be able to come back to them. Okay, so before I go to the next topic, I just wanna pause here to see if there are any questions about these three um, frameworks in which you can use to model light transport and tissue, if there are any questions uh, with respect to those. Todd, so let's... Uh, uh, we need a microphone, please. Yes. Here, Todd. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Is this on? Can you hear me okay? Is there a green light? There is a green light. Yeah, um, then it's I'm your, just going to have to speak up so the room can hear me, and I assume this is being recorded. Yes. Um, so, so I noticed you, you, kind of, you kind of cut off the, the wavelength uh, regime in which we're working at about 10 microns. Um, there's this whole swath from that what 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 I would call far in, or you know mid uh, long wave infrared out to radio wave, which is terahertz. And there's been yeah, a yeah. lot of work going on in terahertz. Yeah. I assume we're not going to hit any of that because it's just too early stage in terms of actual devices that do anything useful out yeah, there. Yeah. So 10 microns, I think, is just arbitrary. Certainly, you can go okay. out to 100 microns or or whatever. It's just kind of light is thought of in that boundary. So it's just kind of a fuzzy okay. parameterization. We're not gonna talk much about ter terahertz imaging here, actually. Um, um, I'm actually quite ignorant about the details of the technology, but ultimately you are probing vibrational states of and rotational states of molecules using terahertz imaging. So yeah, you can certainly, I think, um, model that within the context of so it's interesting. So there, the fundamental wavelength is tens to hundreds of microns. So you would imagine that you need to carry Maxwell's equations to probably the millimeter domain in order to get into kind of a diffusive regime, right? So and so that makes it very interesting with respect to how are you going to, if you want to actually get quantitative models and you're interested in, in spatial scales on the millimeter spatial scale, it seems like it's a, it's a, it's a difficult problem. It would seem. It sounds like you know a little bit more than I do on the, on this topic. No, yeah. I don't. No. <laughs> Very good. There are other hands that are going up. Uh, let's go to uh, to Sean just because he's close by. Actually, on that slide right there, yeah. you're mentioning the Legendre polynomials. Yeah. But um, those are one dimensional. Are you talking about solving on a sphere? Are you talking about a spherical harmonic? Or? Well, you can uh, parameterize that. Uh, the one dimension could be the cosine theta of the of the as of the polar angle. And so here in Legendre polynomials, you assume that you have azimuthal symmetry and you only have directionality in the polar angle. The more rigorous way would be to use the complete spherical harmonics, 
which are not Legendre polynomials, and that handles both variations of that function on a unit sphere, both with polar angle and azimuthal angle. And that's a, a spherical harmonic expansion method. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay, great. I saw other hands, yeah. I think I'm loud enough. But, yeah. um, do uh, RTE models exist that can retain phase information? Um, I think there have been attempts mm -hmm. to um, to do uh, to track phase using RTE models. Actually, our group has done a fair bit of work in that area. Uh, yet, I think you have to use them with extreme caution. Okay. We can maybe talk more about that later. Yeah, because, exactly. like I said, is that it's you know. When a wave propagates through tissue, you have a wave front. And, and so you have all the waves propagating and interacting together. Whereas in a Monte Carlo simulation, you're launching discrete photons. And uh, there's an issue known as ergodicity. Uh, you know, can you actually recapitulate the entire wave front by, by actually launching independent photons that don't interact with each other? Uh, and so the recovery rigorously of diffraction and interference effects within a Monte Carlo context, I think, is not easy at all. And, and we've had some experience with that. And it's, for us, it's, it's been very difficult. Um, I'm hearing Jerry and Jonica whispering in the back, and they may be able to add to this, uh, to this discussion. So maybe, if it's OK, Marco, we'll pass the, the microphone over to the back, and maybe uh, Dr. Spanier or Jonica may have some comment with respect to the use of Monte Carlo methods for electromagnetic wave Actually, propagation. I didn't hear the question completely, John. I was just explaining it to me. John, would you repeat the question, and then we can maybe... So I think, I think the question was, has, has there been any success or... or um, research into the use of Monte Carlo methods to model rigorously electromagnetic wave propagation. Is that a, a fair? Yeah, OK. So Jonica, do you have any, any, any comment to make? We, we tried in certain way, but yeah. uh, it's very hard to model the wave front using Monte Carlo simulation. Just, uh, uh, in Monte Carlo, you, we get particles, not waves. So we have to keep track on each uh, particle with the phase, but it's completely different to the wave. The other thing that I alluded to in going from Maxwell's equations to radio transport, so in the radio transport equation, you assume that every particle lies in the far field of the other particle. What happens is that in the near field, the angular distribution of that wave that comes off of a scattering particle evolves in its angular distribution as it propagates. So, and, and you have to worry about that because if you have another particle in the near field, then that's going to then radiate secondary waves. So then looking at all of these mutual interactions between particles, the secondary scattering, tertiary scattering, and um, becomes very complicated and very difficult to, to model uh, because then you're modifying the fundamental probability distributions you need to use, uh, both with respect to the length scales before you have an additional scattering event and the angular distribution of that scattering, you know, because it varies with space. Um, yeah. I, I would just add one comment. Uh, I think uh, the treatment of light as a wave phenomenon and as a particle phenomenon are really antithetic. They're, they're not, uh, they don't fit well together. And uh, if you think about the treatment of Monte Carlo, where each uh, packet of light is, is represented by a photon, those photons are moving independently of each other. So coherent effects, for example, cannot be captured in such a model. And without coherence, you don't have the EM model. So I think they're intrinsically 
I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know of any literature in which people are attempting to stretch the particle approach to make it a wave phenomenon, but uh, I think there, it would be very difficult to imagine what that would be like. Yeah. Other questions? Any other? Hannah, just one second. Thank you. Um, for the resolution versus depth yeah. graph, real fast. Sure. As a clarification, EM waves and neutral particles, that's not either side of kind of that correlation yeah, it's, line. It's, it's more of a vertical line. It's more left right, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So it's just kind of to the left of roughly, you know, 100 microns. Or it's just. Yeah, just double check. It. Yeah, it's just a cartoon. It's. Great. Yeah, thanks. There was another. Yeah. Uh, in the RT, so no correlation, uh, what is the relate to the homogeneous or non-homogeneous? I'm Can sorry, you I didn't, yeah. you're talking about homogeneous and heterogeneous? Non-homogeneous. I just confused that you mentioned that in the RT, RT the second paragraph is uh, no correlation in a particular position. That's, that's right. Yeah, that's make me feel it should be non-homogeneous medium no rte can handle heterogeneous media you you can write the radiative transport equation in a way where the absorption and scattering parameters of the tissue vary with space so the rte can handle heterogeneous media what we're referring to here is that if you have um, a deterministic structure within the medium, then what happens is that as you propagate a wave, it interacts with the particle, and you know the next particle is in a reproducible, say, array. So that means that you're going to have a deterministic optical phase relationship between the scattering, the first particle, the second particle, third particle, and so on. And so you can actually drive interference effects. So, you know, Many mirrors are a dielectric mirror. It's actually not a reflective surface. It's just layers of refractive index that are spaced precisely at multiples of the wavelength. And so what you have is that the reflectance occurs, or the reflection occurs, because of interference effects. And so if you have a three-dimensional material where you have particles uh, that are assembled uh, on spatial scales that are comparable to the wavelength in a, in a, in a deterministic manner, this description breaks down because you're not assuming that there's a reproducible phase relationship between light waves. So, so does that answer? Does that help? We can maybe we can talk, you know, offline and discuss that further. Okay. Yes. I have a small question. Uh, I didn't catch the difference between uh, LS and the L star. Yeah. So L LS is the I think it's because I didn't describe what L star is. So um, that's my fault. So LS is the mean distance that a photon will travel before encountering a scatterer. And that's on the order of, say, 5 to 50 microns in tissue. It depends on the tissue. L star is something called the transport mean free path. And it's the characteristic distance a photon travels, uh, after which it's lost all memory of its initial direction. If you're a physicist, you know something like persistence length. It's, it's there's no correlation. After, after the photon travels that distance, there's no correlation between its direction and its initial direction. And in tissue, that spatial scale it ranges between about 500 microns to 2 millimeters, Okay, depending on the optical properties or the wavelength and, and the intrinsic tissue itself. So one refers to loss of coherence loss of wave character, that's LS. The second refers to loss of persistence of directionality, and that's L star. Uh, does it mean, uh, I, I thought uh, L star means uh, um, mean plus uh, um, until uh, light uh, scatters uh, bounce. Is it correct? It's, it's not quite correct. So there's something. <coughs> We'll get, let's come back to that question in a little while because I'm going to define mathematically what L star is and that will 
allow us to to probe this issue a little bit more deeply. Aristotle means the the distance where photon loses direction. That's right. That's right. It loses directionality. That's right. Okay. So maybe we'll move forward and, and we'll, we'll be able to probe these issues deep, more deeply. Okay, so, um, so now I wanna talk a little bit about um, this concept of, of the different considerations of the light field, depending on whether you're interested in therapy or diagnostics. Unfortunately, um, red laser pointers have gone out of fashion. Now everything's green, so I can't do the demonstration, but I'm sure all of you have shined a red laser pointer on your finger and your whole finger lights up, right? Or you've gone into a dark room and shine a flashlight, your whole hand lights up. And so clearly light penetrates within tissue. And so this is my crude cartoon of um, shining a laser pointer on, on the top of my finger. And you can imagine um, taking a cross section of the finger and uh, visualizing um, kind of the intensity of the light field in the, in the finger. So this is just a cartoon, a color coding cartoon of if I looked at a certain location in my finger, how many photons are emanating from that location? Okay, and uh, the number of photons per unit time emanating at any given location within a tissue is, is called fluence rate. Um, and if you kind of look at the center line, you'll have some sort of vague distribution. So this tells you about the availability of photons at any given location within the tissue. And this is the parameter of key importance if you're interested, say, in doing a photothermal therapy and you want to drive a temperature rise. Well, the temperature rise is going to be directly related to how many photons are impinging at a given location. Or if you want to drive a chemical reaction, uh, changing a, uh, an inert uh, chemical compound to an active one due to a photochemistry or if you want to drive fluorescence. What's important is what are, what are the number of photons available at any given location to drive that temperature rise or drive that chemical reaction, okay? So the efficacy of these, um, of therapy or fluorescence excitation, excitation depends on the light distribution that occurs within that tissue, okay? Now, if you're interested in diagnostics, which I think is the majority of people in this room, you don't have ac direct access to this distribution. Okay. Um, what you do have access to is, is, say, maybe the light that comes back through the front of the tissue, the reflectance, or the light that gets transmitted, the transmittance. And you have some access to its spatial distribution, say its radial distribution, right? So this is a reflectance or transmittance as a function of a, a lateral dimension. Here, this is the axial dimension Z, lateral dimension, say, X, Y, or rho. And here, you're just limited to the light signals measured at the boundaries. Now, what's very important to recognize is that these two are linked and they intercommunicate. The, the conditions at the boundary affect the three-dimensional light field, first of all. Secondly, heterogeneities or changes in optical properties within the three-dimensional bulk will also change the light field at the boundary. So there's this intercommunication between or this connection between what happens in the tissue and what happens at the surface. And both can affect the other, right? If you change the refractive index mismatch at this top or bottom surface, it will change the internal light field. If something changes within the tissue that changes the optical properties, it's gonna change the surface field, okay? So they're not independent of each other, but they're directly related to each other, okay? So the question then is, is that how do these distributions get formed? And they get formed due to fundamental absorption and scattering interactions in the tissue. So let's just think about in a very kind of cartoonish way, what are the various um, options or uh, that a photon uh, or different life experience as they call that a photon undergoes when impinging uh, in a tissue. So the first thing that can happen is that, okay, if I'm passing light from air to a tissue, you may have some specular reflection due to a refractive index mismatch. Um, we call that reflectance R sub S, reflectance specular. If the light happens to enter the tissue, it may undergo uh, you know, a number of scattering events and get reflected back up the top. We call that 
R sub D for diffuse reflectance. It's not necessarily diffuse. It just means that the light actually entered into the interior of the tissue and then came back out the front side. You can have some scattering that, and the light can hit an absorber. It can get extinguished uh, and go away. It can go through the tissue, get transmitted, and it can get absorbed in dry fluorescence, for instance. Uh, and, but that fluorescence will be at a different wavelength. And if we're just considering monochromatic light transport, we're, we're not concerned necessarily with fluorescence. So a global light balance, you know, you, you have to conserve energy, obviously. And so this, this incident intensity uh, is, is conserved by summing up your, your specular and diffuse reflectance, any absorbers, and any transmission. Okay, and this gives rise, again, in a cartoon fashion, in some sort of internal light field. Now, one thing I want to emphasize here is that, okay, we talked about this, that at any point, uh, kind of the color coding is representative of the total amount of light that's being emitted at any given point. So if you think about this a little more deeply, that this, the amount of light that's coming away, traveling away from any given point, is actually varies with direction, okay? And so here you can just imagine, again, diagrammatically, that this location is fairly close to the laser source and that most likely there's more light that's traveling away from this point than is traveling in the backward direction. You probably have some light traveling in the backward direction because you have some scattering down here and that can bounce light in the, in the reverse direction. Uh, you have light that's being uh, being, uh, you know, transversely dissipated as well. And of course, this is just the plane of the page. If this is a three-dimensional object, you have a whole, whole, um, whole azimuthal variation in that light field. And so this would, if you understood the full angular distribution of this, of this propagation, that is truly the most complete description of the light transport in this, in this tissue. And this is what we know, what is known as the radiance. So we have a light field that varies in space. So X, Y, Z, three parameters here. That's given by the bold R. And then you have, at that location, you have a variation in direction. And um, in spherical coordinates, you can, you can denote any location on the surface of a unit sphere by two directions, a polar and an azimuthal angle. So that's what's given by omega here. And then, of course, your light source can be varying with time. So this is the six-dimensional object called radiance. Three dimensions in space, two dimensions in angle or direction, one dimension in time. The units are watts, which is kind of photons per second, uh, per unit area, per unit solid angle, still radiance. And we'll talk about solid angle in just a second. Um, Richard, can we dim the lights in the front, please? Just these. Yeah. yeah, I think, yeah, you can turn them off, actually. That'd be great. Thanks. I think that helps. Okay. Okay, so we're going to now try and figure out how we can set up a rigorous framework for determining this radiance. Okay. So let's do some basic kind of high school uh, or undergraduate um, optics. So, so just consider one dimensional propagation of light um, where we're just propagating light from left to right in a, in a, in a slab which only has absorption. Um, and the attenuation of light is linked to the spatial decay of this radiance traveling along the direction S. And the loss of light the, is linked to the amount of absorption, mu sub a. So this is a spatial gradient, dl ds. And that loss of light is, you know, obviously you're going to be losing light, so you have a negative on the right-hand side. It's linked to the amount of absorber you have, and it's linked to the incident intensity. So if you just, you know, bring all the l's to one side, all the s's to the other, you integrate, you get classic Beer's law that the decay of this radiance in this direction omega, we're only considering one direction going directly from left to right, decays 
as Beer's law parameterized by mu sub a, which is an absorption coefficient, which has units of inverse length, okay? And this exponential decay is Beer's law. And the nice thing about this is that once a photon is absorbed, it's gone, right? So they no longer propagate in the tissue, okay? Now, scattering is a little different. Uh, you can also think about scattering as a Beer's law. You can, again, think about that you have a radiance of light going from left to right. The light can scatter. The light um, still doesn't disappear, but it ends up propagating in a different direction, right? So it is, even the light still exists, it's no longer traveling in direction omega. It's traveling in some different direction called omega prime. So if you're just considering the radiance at a given location s in that given direction omega, it still has been depleted from that direction. And therefore, you still have a Beer's law that characterizes the light propagation in that direction omega, okay? And so the scattered photons continue to propagate by a di different direction omega prime, and we have to track that if we're thinking about modeling this in a three-dimensional situation. But at least in this one-dimensional situation, you still have a Beer's law. And if you want to look at total attenuation of photons occurring due to both absorption and scattering, you can uh, write another Beer's law where you use this coefficient mu sub t, which is referred to as a total interaction coefficient. Mu t is just the sum, the linear sum of mu a and mu s, okay? Also with units inverse length. So what's important to know is that if you take the reciprocal of mu s, then you have the single scattering length, L sub s. L sub s is just the reciprocal of mu sub s. You can also take the reciprocal of mu sub a and get an absorption length, okay? And those two spatial scales are actually very different, as we'll discuss shortly. Okay, so I just wanted to introduce absorption and scattering independently so that it's a little clear that you know the, the difference between the two. And if you're interested in modeling a three-dimensional media that accounts for light transport uh, you have to go to the radio transport equation. And I'm going to try to go through this equation to make sure you understand the physical meaning of each of these terms. And uh, it looks daunting uh, with all the you know, crazy notation, but it's actually fairly simple conceptually. So on the left-hand side, I'm just interested in looking at the, uh, the radiance at a given location r in a single direction, omega at a given time. So we can have a light field that varies with time. And if I'm just sitting at this green point here, I want to be able to know what is the time rate of change of the light, uh, of the radiance in that direction omega as a function of time, okay? V here is just the speed of light in the medium, okay? Which is just the speed of light in vacuum divided by the refractive index. So how can this light uh, the, the radiance change with time. Well, obviously light is moving, so you're gonna have light loss due to propagation away from that location. And that's given by the spatial gradient of the radiance, the distribution, uh, the spatial distribution of light. And you're interested not in that gradient in any direction, you're interested in that gradient only along the direction of propagation that you're focusing on. That's omega. So you have to take the dot product of the spatial gradient of this light field onto this direction omega, and that's a loss because it's traveling away. So that's one way you can lose light. The other way you can lose light is that the light traveling in this direction at this point undergoes an interaction. That interaction can either happen through absorption, right? It gets absorption, it gets lost, or through scattering. Now, the light is still there after it scatters, but it is lost from direction omega, okay? So it goes to some other direction, okay? So these two are losses, one due to propagation or streaming, one loss due to interaction. Now, the other thing that can happen is that you can actually gain light through scattering, meaning that you could have another photon coming at another direction, going along its merry way, encounters a scatter at this location and gets scattered into omega that you're considering, okay? And that's what this complicated integral term uh, considers. So the first important aspect of this is this uh, 
this part of the equation, which is p as a function of location going from some arbitrary direction omega prime and getting scattered into direction omega. So p is known as something called a single scattering phase function. It has nothing to do with optical phase. It is a probability density function. It's the probability that light at this location will get scattered from some direction omega prime into omega. And obviously, there are a lot of different omega primes, right? There are many ways that light can approach this point. It can approach it from here, approach it from here. It can approach it from the back of the room into that point. So again, you can imagine that that green, that green point is surrounded by a unit sphere, and light can come at that green point from any location on that unit sphere. And so no matter what omega prime it comes at, there's some probability that light gets scattered from omega prime to omega. So we've got to integrate the contributions um, along all the possible other directions omega prime. The surface area of a unit sphere is 4 pi, so this integral over 4 pi means that you're integrating over all possible directions. And of course, the amount of light that you actually get is linked to the amount of light that actually is available at those other directions, omega prime. So it's the product between the probability of getting scattered into omega times the amount of light that's actually available at that omega prime. And then you have to multiply all this by the actual number of scatterers, density of scatterers at location. If there's no scattering, then you know it, it doesn't matter if there's a high probability of of, of getting converted from omega prime to omega, because if there's no scattering, you're not going to get that gain. And then, of course, you can have a source that emits light in a given location. So this is kind of the, the equation that you have to solve. And uh, mathematically, it, it doesn't look too uh, easy, right? You've got a time derivative here. You've got uh, a spatial gradient here. And you've got this, this funky angular integral here, OK? It's actually a, a very formidable equation to solve. Um, analytically. Okay. Any questions about this? So, because I know um, I didn't give an introduction slide, but I came to this field from as a mechanical engineer from heat transfer. So I was very familiar with heat transfer, thermal diffusion, and it took me a long time to wrap my head around this radiance because not only do you have spatial variation, but you have directional variation. And it took me a long, long time to kind of just grasp that conceptually. So, are there any questions here, Robert? Uh, we need microphone. So when you talk about solving it in a typical setting, what are you usually given, or what can you assume is there for you, and what was your output at the end of the day? Okay. So what you would have to know, of course, you have to you have to assume a speed of light. You know, you have to assume um, your mu sub a, your absorption coefficient, your scattering coefficient, and your phase function. Okay. And if you have any sources, you need to have a mathematical description of that source. What you get out in the end is what we are uh, desiring, which is the complete description of light field, which is L. You'll get the complete description at any location in that domain. You'll know the amount of light and its direction of propagation. Okay, so you have a complete, if it's a continuous light source, you'll have a five dimensional description. There's no time variation. You have a complete spatial angular field. If there's a time variation, then you'll have a, a spatial and temporal description. OK? Yeah. Other questions? Sean. So when you talk about solving this, um, does this often have or ever have an analytic solution, or is it always an approximation? So there has been, um, there have been uh, analytical solutions to this equation, um, or at least you can represent it analytically, but you numerically compute it in simple cases. Um, one-dimensional cases, there's actually a closed form solution in one-dimensional slab, actually a fairly straightforward uh, solution. In, in about, over the last 10 years, actually, there have been three-dimensional um, solutions, but they're notoriously hard to compute because their convergence is extremely slow. So you get an infinite series. Um, I think the two groups that have really pioneered this is um, a group of uh, John Shotland and Vadim Markel, um, and uh, the group of Arnold Kim at UC Merced. So um, I can point you to references if you're interested. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. 
think I saw another hand. Is there another? Okay. Okay. Good. So I also alluded to the fact that you can um, also treat polarization within a radiator transport con uh, context. Uh, here I've just replaced it the L's with I's, where the I represents a Stokes vector, and each element of the Stokes vector uh, gives you a different quality or a different characterization of the parallel and perpendicular components of the light of the electric field, parallel and perpendicular components and complex conjugate. So the, the main change here is that you, you, you replace L with I, which is now a vector, and that the phase function gets more um, challenging because now you have four components here and you can have transitions uh, in polarization upon scattering. So the scattering, the phase function, which was you know, originally just a um, two-dimensional um, probability density function as a function of azimuthal angle and polar angle now becomes uh, a matrix uh, where you have intercommunication between all of these four Stokes vectors. So um, it can be, uh, it can be a, a four by four matrix, each of which has a probability density function. So you have 16 probability density functions. Okay. So um, it's not an easy problem to solve. And actually in tissue, you know, there's a lot of debate. How do you form this scattering matrix? How can you get information on what that scattering matrix should look like? Okay. So Robert pointed out, okay, what will you have at the end? You'll have this radiance, and that's wonderful. Usually we don't measure the radiance, right? We're either interested in, say, uh, you can put a, if you're interested, you could stick in an interstitial probe within the bulk of a, of a tissue, which sometimes is done um, in a therapy situation, or you can measure reflectance or transmittance. So the question is, is that, well, if I have a solution to the radiance, okay, how in the world can I get either the fluence rate, which I mentioned earlier, what is the total amount of light emitting from a certain point, or how do I get reflectance or transmittance? So that you can solve mathematically, and I'll just go through the steps real quickly. So from the RTE solution, how do we calculate the total light present in a given location within tissue? So, so phi is the fluence rate. It's just that it's a scalar. It's independent of direction. It's just how much light is coming out at this point. So essentially here, what we do is we've got to integrate the radiance over all angles, right? Because the light can emit from that point in all angles. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Um, so we adopt spherical coordinates. You guys all remember this from, from, uh, from high school. So um, they're essentially any point on the unit sphere is parameterized by a polar angle theta and azimuthal angle phi. So you got to integrate this. So if you look at a section of that spherical surface, this arc here is given by a length delta theta. And if you go around, you, you kind of scoop around the z-axis, the, this arc is given by r sine theta delta phi. So we think about the unit sphere. So r is 1 everywhere. So this um, integral gets broken up into the integral of the radiance times sine theta uh, delta phi, which is this arc here and delta theta, which is this arc here. The ranges of theta and phi are that theta goes from zero, which in this diagram is directly up. And you can go from zero to pi over two to pi. And for every theta, you got to go around the z-axis. So you have a phi going from zero to two pi. Okay, And so that integral is, is not too bad to do. Um, now, the other thing that we're interested in is, is the reflectance or the transmittance. There, typically what you have is a planar detector that resides outside the tissue. Okay, So what we need to consider is not necessarily the light field right inside the tissue, but the light field that emanates from the surface of the tissue. So you're interested in the radiance at a z location just outside of z equals zero on the negative side of z, right? So the tissue domain here is represented by positive z, the air side, so to speak, or whatever you have on the other side of the tissue is the negative domain. You want to, 
this is a di diagram of the uh, depiction of the light field outside the tissue. I've purposely made it discontinuous here because if you have a refractive index mismatch, this light field will be discontinuous at that boundary. And what you need to do is that you need to integrate this radiance over the backward hemisphere. So you need to integrate it for all directions omega where the dot product of omega with z is less than zero, right? Because z positive is going downwards and you're looking at all directions where you have a negative dot product. And not only are you interested in that integration over all of those angles in that negative hemisphere, but you actually have to hit this with a cosine term. And that's because when you have a planar detector, the apparent area of that detector changes uh, depending on the angle that you approach that area. So if you're grazing it at 90 degrees, the detector has zero area. So that cosine goes to zero. And so, um, so essentially you have to project this light field on the outward pointing unit normal of that detector. And so, um, and then you, you again use, um, use uh, spherical coordinates and you can do that. Okay, so that's how you go from radiance to reflectance or transmittance. Okay, so I'm gonna now shift to optical properties of tissue. So we're kind of putting away the math for a while. You won't see math until, actually you'll have a little bit more math, but. It's a different, uh, different bit of, uh, of characterization. So we're going to move to tissue properties. So any questions on, on, on radio transport, radiance, um, reflectance, transmittance, fluence rate? Everything good? Okay. So now let's go to, um, let's go to optical scattering and absorption properties. So as I alluded to earlier, the structures and tissue um, that are of interest in biomedical applications spans uh, an impressive uh, range of spatial scales, all the way from, say, lipid membranes and organelles, which have characteristic dimensions on the order of tens of nanometers, all the way to cells, collagen fiber bundles, nuclei, which have spatial scales on the order of five to 10 microns. And depending on, and, and the visible spectrum that we tend to use in, in biomedical photonics kind of lies right in the center of this kind of hierarchy of tissue scales. And, and this diagram was originally developed by Steve Jacques at Oregon Health Sciences University. Um, just to give us this, this impressive understanding of, of, the, of the, the range of spatial scales. And it turns out that the way that um, these structures interact and scatter light are, are strongly affected by their characteristic sizes and their relative refractive index. Okay, and so, um, for instance, uh, and there's sometimes a kind of a fractal or multi-scale nature to the scattering. So mitochondria, which are responsible for generating ATP within cells, they have a characteristic size on the order of a micron or two, and as a whole, they scatter light. But within the mitochondria, there are all these membranous structures that uh, have spatial scales on the order of tens of nanometers. So this thing has a very um, complicated nanostructure, which, um, which uh, displays very interesting light scattering properties. And we'll talk about this a little bit more further, uh, a, little, a little further later, is that when the characteristic st size of the biological structure is on the order of much, more, much larger than the wavelength, your, um, the dependence of scattering is weakly varying with wavelength. This should be a lambda, not an L. So the scattering kind of decays like an inverse parallel with the linear uh, exponent of, of lambda, one over lambda, you have a kind of very weak drop off with scattering coefficient with wavelength. Whereas if the object is much smaller, this drop off is very rapid. It, it goes as one over lambda to the fourth. The other thing that's important is that you also have this hierarchy in not only cellular structure, but extracellular structure. So collagen is a classic example. The collagen in the cornea of your eye has this nanostructure um, that's very regular on the order of, of 60 to 70 nanometers. Um, and that collagen in that very ordered fashion 
allows your cornea to be transparent. It's the same cornea that's in your skin. Your skin is completely opaque, and, and that's because the collagen is, is packaged in a very different way, and the collagen fiber bundles in your skin is on the order of two to three microns. So how do we describe the scattering? So kind of from a fundamental electromagnetic perspective, we're going to see this in more detail in Jonica's lecture this afternoon. If you think about light incident on a particle, you have an electric field propagating with some incident polarization, parallel and perpendicular polarization. There's this something called the scattering amplitude matrix, which you can get from the solution to Maxwell's equation, which tells you how when this incident wave is incident on this, on this particle, how the parallel and perpendicular polarization of light will get modified through that scattering and get re-emitted as scattered light. Okay, And this scattering amplitude matrix, the nature of it uh, is actually will inform uh, the magnitude of the scattering coefficient and the form of this phase function, the angular distribution of light. So how, from the scattering amplitude matrix, we, we can get mu sub s. And so the easiest way to think about this is think about a plane wave incident on a particle with a detector that is placed on the other side. You'll see, obviously, at that detector, you're likely to measure less light than was incident. And if you look at the loss of intensity of the light um, over all directions, and you take the ratio of the scattered intensity, so the electric field squared over the in incident intensity, you can express that um, in terms of a cross-section, a, a physical area, and that can be parameterized by something called a scattering efficiency and an area. Now, this area is just the cross-sectional area of the particle. And so you can imagine that if this particle was refractively index matched to the medium, so there's no refractive index mismatch, but it was completely black, like a hockey puck, which is absorb every single photon that is incident upon it, then your scattering efficiency would be one, right? Basically, everything that hits this get absorbed, and your scattering cross-section is just the same thing as the actual cross-section of the particle. Now, in reality, this particle can absorb and scatter light, and so the scattering efficiency can be larger than one. And essentially, the product of this scattering cross-section with the number density of scatterers, which would be number per unit volume, will give you a scattering coefficient. So this ratio of scattered intensity to incident intensity is directly related to this scattering amplitude matrix, right? And then that gives rise to this scattering cross-section, and the scattering cross-section times the actual number of scatterers you have gives scattering coefficient. So that relates how you go from a Maxwell's equation context to the radiator transport context, which you use mu sub s. So mu sub s does not appear anywhere in Maxwell's equations, right? So it's, it's really a derived parameter. So now I want to focus on kind of what are the characteristics of scattering. So the first thing I want to talk about are, uh, are mi scatterers. Typically, um, so Gustav Mi was the first person to actually solve Maxwell's equations for interaction with a dielectric particle, uh, a dielectric sphere. And the key characteristic of me scatterers, i.e. scatterers which have a dimension that are comparable to much larger than the wavelength, are twofold. So number one, so this is a polar plot of the angular distribution of scattered light uh, given by an incident a wavelength of 650 nanometers. The light is traveling from left to right. Um, and this is a polar plot on a logarithmic scale. And so you see uh, that two things, number one, a lot, most of the light is actually scattered directly forward. You have this huge forward peak. And this is a logarithmic scale, so you can see that this is basically close to the, ma the maximum. And then the rest of the scattered field is basically, what, one, two, almost three orders of magnitude lower in intensity. So particles that are much larger than, or on the same order and larger than the wavelength of light have this characteristic that most of the light is scattered directly forward and you have this weaker uh, scattering over other, other angles. The other thing that you see is that this is not a smooth function. 
This is a function with a lot of structure, a lot of undulations. And the reason for that is that if you think about it, relative to the wavelength, you've got this huge particle. Okay, in this case, this is a particle of 20 microns in diameter. And your wavelength is less than a micron. So if you snapshot in time the light wave as it travels through the particle, you've got many oscillations of that light wave in that one particle. So if you look at the dipoles within that particle, the dipoles have very different orientations. And, they're, and since the light is propagating, those dipoles are, 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 are rotating and re-emitting radiation. And they're doing so with very different phases. So if you are in some directions, those dipoles constructively interfere, and you get a local peak. In other directions, they destructively interfere, and you get a, you get a diminishment. And so this structure is related to the constructive and destructive interference generated by all of these multiple dipoles that are oscillating at slightly different, uh, are, not, it would, are not synchronized. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're oscillating at slightly different, um, different phase to each other. And this only happens when the wavelength of light is smaller than the particle. A few other characteristics is that you get a very weak dependence of your scattering coefficient with lambda. So here it's a 1 over lambda to the 0.4 power. Um, you have a, a linear, a, a strong positive relationship with the refractive index of the particle and a relationship with the, with the radius of the particle. And m here is the relative refractive index, the refractive index of the particle relative to the medium. OK? Now, when you have particles much smaller than the wavelength of light. You have what's called the Rayleigh limit of me scattering. Here you can think of the particle as just a single dipole, right? You have a small particle, you have a huge wave. The whole part dipole in that particle just oscillates in, in, in synchrony. And what that gives rise to, depending on the polarization of light, you get these very smooth, uh, either a, an isotropic emission pattern with, with, uh, with angle, or you get a lobed structure, depending on whether you have, in one case, perpendicular polarization versus parallel polarization. And the green is if you have unpolarized light. So here, this is on a linear plot, not logarithmic. So this is very smooth. The, um, the scattering cross-section has a strong dependence on, on the radius of the particle, uh, the radius to the sixth power. And it, has a very, it decays very strongly with um, with the wavelength of light, 1 over lambda to the fourth. So here, the angular distribution is symmetric. There's equal amounts of light scattered forward and backwards, and it varies very gently with polar angle. Okay, So this is more representative of light scattering with very small biological structures, such as lysosomes, um, cell organelles, et cetera. So tissue is a little bit more complicated. It's really um, a mixture of really a me scattering. Um, you know, in the diffusion approximation, we further reduce the scattering properties from mu sub s and the phase function to something called mu s prime and g. Mu s prime is referred to as an isotropic scattering coefficient, and g is referred to as a single scattering anisotropy or asymmetry coefficient. Let me first talk about g. g, instead of trying to look at the whole structure of this angular distribution, which can be very complicated. We just want to get a sense of, for its directionality. Does a particle strongly forward scatter light, or is it roughly equally forward or backward scattered? That can be very well characterized by g. g is the average cosine of the scattering angle. So if something doesn't scatter at all, it just goes directly straight, your average cosine is, the, the theta is 0, and your cosine is 1. So for g going to 1, or much, not that much smaller than 1, you have a very strong forward scattering. So me scatterers tend to have g's around 0 0.9 or 0.95, very 0.8. Um, scatterers uh, such as Rayleigh scatterers, they have g of 0 because they equally for, scatter forward or backward. Okay. Now, the reduced scattering coefficient is a way of kind of putting two types of particles on an equal playing field. You may have a lot of scatterers in a system. So you have lots of mu s because you've got a lot of number density of scatterers. But they all scatter light very, very forward. So g can be very close to 1. So even though the 
the light may be undergoing many, many scattering events, the direction isn't being randomized because the light keeps on getting scattered forward. By contrast, you can have a system with very few scatterers, but they're very small, uh, and therefore they scatter light in all directions. So there, the G is closer to zero. You don't need as many scattering events to completely uh, randomize the light field. So this reduced scattering coefficient gives you the spatial scale for which you lose memory of the, um, of the scattering direction. And I think I had a question uh, by you earlier about the, what L star is and how that relates to the directionality. And L star is very closely connected with mu sub s prime, okay? The direct loss of directionality. So the question is, how do we characterize the wavelength dependence of scattering? And so this, these plots come from a very informative paper from Steve Jacques a few years ago, where from a lot of experimental measurements, he tried to fit the spectral dependence of scattering to um, various power laws. The most simplistic way you can do it is just assume that uh, you, you uh, have a, a single uh, power law that indicates the wavelength dependence of scattering, and A is just the intensity of scattering. And so B tells you, you know, how rapidly does the scattering fall off with wavelength. If you have a me scatterer, uh, a tissue dominated by me scatterers, that B value should be on the order of anywhere from about 0.3 to say 0.5 or 0.6, 0.7. If you've got a lot of Rayleigh scatterers, B will be larger. Another way you can do this, a little bit more sophisticated, you could say that, well, I've got um, a tissue that's populated with some Rayleigh scatterers, a fraction of Rayleigh scatterers, which I know the wavelength dependence should identically be minus four. And the rest of the scatterers are, have, some, have some power law uh, that goes with uh, minus B. And here, B captures only the me scatterer, so I do B sub me. So obviously, if you have something that's populated with a lot of me scatterers and not much Rayleigh scatterers, the fraction of Rayleigh should go to zero. And the B exponent of B me relative to B here, where you only have a single power law, should be the same. So here is a plot of the experimentally, what is the relationship between this ratio between the B acquired looking only at the me scatterers relative to the B looking at all of the scatterers. And here at one, these are all the tissues that don't have a lot of Rayleigh component. And as the increase in uh, the fraction of Rayleigh scatterers increase, you get a reduction uh, in this B sub me relative to B. And here is just a relationship to uh, between B and, and B sub me. Basically, if you're on this diagonal, you're essentially on tissues that have very little Rayleigh scattering. If you're below the diagonal, you've got tissues with a lot of Rayleigh scattering. Okay, and you'll have this reference to look at. You also have tissues that have a wide range of A parameters. So you have tissues such as epidermis and skin, where this A parameter is very, very large, uh, onto, say, tissues such as breast or lung, which may, relative to skin or epidermis, may have a scattering coefficient that's maybe one tenth of that of skin. Okay? And then, of course, you have various tissues with differing. Uh, phase functions or different scattering anisotropies, which vary as a function of wavelength. Okay, so now I just want to move to absorption and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so one thing that you have to be careful of when you go into literature and you try to pull out values for absorption coefficient is that there are kind of two schools of thought. There's the kind of the spectroscopist's school of thought uh, from chemistry which uh, thinks about absorption in terms of optical density. So you have this classical uh, absorber in a cuvette. You measure the transmitted um, intensity, and you, use, uh, you measure an optical density, which is basically the transmissivity, which is I over I naught. And you uh, characterize optical density as, a, as the exponent of a power of 10. So this optical density is a product of your molar extinction coefficient, which has units of one over molarity and path length times the concentration of that, uh, of that uh, chromophore, or that molecule, times the optical path length. Now, um, in the physics literature, they kind of adopt more of a particle context. Uh, similar to a scattering cross-section, you can think of things as in terms of an absorption cross-section and a number density of absorbers and a path length. And here, 
this product of absorption cross-section and number density of absorbers gives rise to mu sub a. So you'll find that mu sub a is different than epsilon, okay? And they're related by a natural log of 10 because here you have an exponential on base e and here you have a, a, a base 10. And so um, you have to be careful with factors of, of natural log of 10, which is a little more than two. So here you can get mu a, the reciprocal of mu a is a mean free path for photon travel uh, for absorption. Now what are absorption coefficients in tissue? Um, this is a um, absorption spectra of, of biomolecules present in tissue. What's really important is that in the ultraviolet and even near visible, you have lots of absorption due to protein and due to water. Once you, uh, and in the visible, you also have a lot of absorption due to oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. Once you get beyond about 600 nanometers, you have a tremendous drop off in absorption due to blood. And that actually gives rise to the ability to penetrate, for light to penetrate very deeply in tissue. Now, once you get into the near infrared, the absorption of water picks up. And then again, the light doesn't penetrate so deeply. And then farther out, you get absorption by collagen and lots of other interesting things. So it's really this drop off in the absorption of blood that gives rise to your ability to penetrate very deeply in tissue. This is usually referred to as the optical uh, window, which is basically around 650 nanometers out to 1100 nanometers. Now, also important is that you have scattering that is decaying with the wavelength over this wavelength regime. So what's important from a modeling context is the ratio of scattering to absorption. So here, I'm plotting what is the ratio of reduced scattering to absorption. And here you see, again, in the, in the near visible, you have a fair bit of absorption. Um, scattering is dominant, but not hugely dominant. But once the absorption of blood drops off, you get this huge increase in the amount of scattering relative to absorption, which allows you to use the diffusion approximation, uh, as we'll see. And this, uh, and you really have a strong, a light field that's dominated by multiple scattering until the absorption of water picks up and beyond 1200, again, you have to worry about absorption quite a bit. So typically, one can use this diffusion approximation to the radiator transport equation when mu s prime is much, much larger than mu a and that's typically in this wavelength regime. And outside of this regime, you've got to use radiative transport equation, Monte Carlo, or electromagnetics that better handle uh, absorption. And then this combination of uh, optical properties of tissue and the physics of the light transport gives rise to spatial and temporal scales. So we've already talked about these a little bit. The reciprocal of the absorption and scattering coefficients give you characteristic spatial scales for absorption and scattering. You'll see that in tissue, the spatial scales for absorption are much, much longer than that of scattering. So you have typical uh, lengths of a meter that a photon has to travel before encountering an absorption event, whereas you're in the tens of microns for scattering. This also means that the characteristic time that a photon has to propagate before getting absorbed or getting scattered are very different. So absorption happens on the time scale of a few hundred picoseconds to tens of nanoseconds, whereas the time scale for scattering is on the order of femtoseconds. So again, this has direct implication for spatial modulation. You know, if you want to be exclusively uh, sensitive to scattering, you have to spatially modulate at very high frequencies. But if you want to be uh, sensitive to absorption, you want to spatially modulate at very low frequencies. Similarly, if you want to be uh, sensitive to absorption, you want to modulate in time at lower frequencies. Whereas if you want to be exclusively sensitive to scattering, you've got to modulate at high frequencies. And we'll talk about the actual, um, actual numbers for that later on. And then we'll talk about these other um, optical coefficients uh, a little later. We, we've talked about mu t and, and mu s prime already. A key aspect here is mu effective, this effective attenuation coefficient, which we'll see uh, governs the optical penetration depth of light. And then from here, I just want to kind of bear in mind things that you're going to see for the rest of the week. And so I talked about, uh, I mentioned or alluded to being able to control and measure light by both shaping or probing the spatial distribution of light 
and the temporal distribution of light. So kind of in our field, kind of the two earliest ways of probing spatial and temporal distributions of light is one, you know, just sending a collimated beam into tissue and just measuring the radial decay of light. And this radial decay is linked to both the absorption and scattering. And it happens on, on spatial scales that are linked to uh, mu sub a and mu sub s. You can also, instead of putting a continuous beam of light, you can put a pulse of light and see how it gets dispersed in time. And the time scales over which this rises and falls is linked directly to the, the characteristic times for scattering and absorption. And then you can also do this in the Fourier domain. So you could do a spatial Fourier transform and look at ver spatial variations, uh, illuminate the light with a sinusoidal or other patterns and look at how the amplitude and phase of that spatial pattern get modified. Or you could do a modulation in time and you can look at how that photon density wave, how the amplitude and phase get modulated with frequency. And both of these can be used to extract absorption scattering coefficients. And you're gonna be seeing this later on this week. So with that lengthy introduction, I'll close it here, open up for questions and we'll have a break after that. So any questions? Yes. Jeff. I'm still trying to get my head around this, when you could use the reduced scattering versus the scattering and phase function. And then also, um, how do those relate back to reflectance and like how many scattering events do you have to go through before you actually get the light to turn around and measure reflectance back? Okay. Okay, let me just uh, take the second question first. How many light, uh, how many scattering events do you have to uh, undergo in order to get light back? Well, you do get light back uh, from superficial depths in tissue even after a single scattering event. So there is some light available even after a single scattering event. It's just, it's all about distributions. You know, you, in Monte Carlo simulations, you can actually say, okay, all of all the photons I capture, what is the histogram of the number of scattering events they underwent? before they came back out. And conceptually, how you can tease that out, one way of teasing that out is doing a time resolved measurement. Because obviously the ones that came out earlier traveled a smaller path length and underwent fewer scattering events than those that come out later. They underwent many, many scattering events and then came out later. So the number of scattering events is related directly to optical path length in the tissue. And again, the ones that travel, undergo just a few scattering events and come back out, they're intrinsically sensitive to changes in scattering in the tissue, but they're not sensitive to absorption because they haven't traveled enough path length to get attenuated. But the ones that you know, stayed in the tissue a, a while before coming out, those are the ones that are sensitive to absorption because they went through a long path length before coming back out. Okay, so that's the second question. Remind me of what the first question is. Uh, just the going from the reduced uh, scattering coefficient to Got scattering it. coefficient. Okay. Function. So this refers to uh, an earlier part of the lecture uh, where we talked about going from Monte Carlo to the diffusion approximation. So, and we refer to the domain where you use Monte Carlo as the transport regime. And the transport regime is the regime where you've lost all optical phase relationships in the tissue in the light because it's undergone sufficient scattering that you've lost the phase information, but you may still have directionality in the light transport. And in that case, you've got to keep, you've got to worry about the phase function in mu s. Now, once you lose directionality, you've lost sensitivity to the phase function. The, the light no longer has memory of its initial direction, and that's when you can get away with mu s prime and g. Okay? There are other um, hands. Let's... Oh, it seems uh, there is no uh, uh, reflective index it considered in RTE. Is it correct? Okay. So the refractive index comes in two ways. One is, of course, through the, prop the speed of light in that, so, the, so you, 
you're intrinsically assuming that there's a mean refractive index of the medium that governs the speed of light. The refractive index comes through mu s and the phase function. So mu s, uh, the, the, the magnitude of mu s is linked to, um, to the relative refractive index because the scattering cross section is linked to the relative refractive index. And the phase function, the angular distribution of light scattering is linked to that re relative refractive index. Uh, I mean, uh, in OCT, uh, I guess uh, uh, refractive index change uh, is detected uh, by box scattering. That's right. Uh, I'm not sure uh, such kind of uh, final refraction inside tissues uh, is considered in, is treated by RTE or not. Uh, okay. Okay, so there are two things uh, going on here. O OCT is a, which we're going to hear about in this next lecture, is a technology that relies on coherence and interference. So a rigorous treatment of OCT must be a Maxwell's equation based treatment because RTE does not handle coherence and interference. However, as I showed, there is a direct linkage to the mu s parameter and the, the phase function to the scattering amplitude matrix, which comes from Maxwell's equations. So, so again, the RTE is not meant to model issues of coherence, interference, et cetera, but yet they are grounded in, you know, the, the scattering characteristics are grounded in, in, in an electromagnetic wave treatment of, of, uh, of scattering. Does that help? Uh, it, yes, but, but after uh, diffusion approximation, yeah. uh, I think the uh, uh, surface function will disappear. That's right. And the diffusion approximation, so it doesn't disappear entirely. So in the P1 approximation, it disappears. But if you go to P3 or P5 or P7, what you'll get is you'll get moments of the phase function. They start to appear. So if you take out the Legendre polynomial expansion or the spherical harmonic expansion beyond the first order, then you'll be sensitive to characteristics of the phase function. Thank you very much. OK. Robert. Talking a bit about uh, going from a point source to a sinusoidal pattern. Yeah. One thing that's not completely clear to me is that in, in practice, you're gonna, you're not going to be projecting a collimated sinusoid. You're going to be having some sort of point source or projector system, and yet it seems that a lot of the models rely on collimated beams. So, what happens in practice? What happens in the models when we start talking about that change in angle? So. You do have to go to more sophisticated models. Typically, the numerical apertures, if you really think about numerical aperture, they're still pretty small. So I think you know, the real impact of you know, often you have a camera that's, stand, that's standing off from your target at a pretty significant distance. You probably know the numerical apertures you work with, probably. What are they? Are they 0 0.1, 0 0.05? You know, the, you're right, yeah. But if you're, so if, if you're, you know, you start to look at you know numerical aperture of 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, where you really have a significant cone angle. Then you're going to have to go to more sophisticated models, and there are more sophisticated models out there uh, that handle this. So, uh, and certainly you can treat this in Monte Carlo simulations quite rigorously, and we do that in our group. So, um, yes, there are approximations, and you can get a sense for uh, you know the validity of those approximations by doing some experiments and doing some matching on unknown known systems. But um, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. We can talk offline. I mean, I can talk a lot more about it, but I think that's good. There, are, yes. What, 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 what is the uh, uh, advantage and the disadvantage between uh, special spatial resolved reflectance and uh, spatially frequency domain reflectance. We're going to talk about that on day four, but um, let me just say that the just briefly 
the advantage of, of working in the spatial frequency domain is that it's a relative measurement. You know, you, you, you want to see the reduction of the, of, of the amplitude relative to an incident wave. So you get, your, whereas spatially resolved uh, measurements, you, you need to take care to be able to get that absolute intensity absolutely correctly. Spatial frequency domain imaging, although it has some limitations, you can get a wide field um, view of op variation of optical properties with fairly good resolution, albeit you have to treat that resolution with a grain of salt. Um, and we can get into that later. In defense of spatial resolved reflectance is that I think you can get more spatial penetration using spatially resolved uh, techniques if you have large source detector separations. Whereas I think in spatial frequency domain imaging, you tend not to get as much depth penetration. We'll talk about that and, and the relationship between sensitivities to scattering and absorption uh, later this week. But don't worry, we're gonna we're gonna dive into that pretty heavily. Yeah. Yes, Hannah. Thank you. Um, going back to the power loss with the reduced scattering. Yeah. Coefficient. Sure. Um, with the Jacques paper, there was always a lambda naught. Yes. So is that always reference to some specific wavelength? That's right. So um, lambda naught is a reference wavelength. The reference wavelength that is used is not uniform across uh, publications. On some level, it doesn't really matter. So lambda naught, so just think about this. When lambda equals lambda naught, this, this is just one, right? And one to any power is one, right? So, it just, so A is essentially the value of mu s prime at the reference wavelength. And so typically in literature, Sometimes they use lambda naught. I think in Jacques' paper, he used 500 nanometers. So A is just mu s prime at 500 nanometers. Sometimes they use one micron, you know. Yeah, so, but it's arbitrary, but it just, it just gives you an anchor. So it's yeah. mostly for the A and B parameters and not for mu s prime? No, what I'm saying is that the value of A is equal to mu s prime at lambda naught, right? So the value of A is mu s prime at the reference wavelength. Okay. Does that answer your question? 